The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Drummond Capital Partners Proprietary Limited, ABN 15622-660-182, AFSL number CAR 0012600050 of AFSL 334906 and is limited to publicly available information. General advice may be provided by our sponsor, but does not take into account your objectives, financial situation or needs. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the XY Advisor podcast a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Drummond Capital is an independent, institutional-grade investment manager passionate about supporting businesses with the implementation of managed accounts. While the growth in the sector has been significant, many businesses are not reaping the benefits. Understanding the journey and partnering with a truly independent business who is focused on achieving success for the advice practice is critical. Partnership is at the heart of what Drummond does, from investment management to client servicing and communications to business strategy support. Hello and welcome to this topic series where we're talking about the 12 steps to implementing managed accounts into an advice business. My name is Fraser Jack and in this episode number three of four, we cover steps seven, eight and nine in the change management process. In step seven, we think about the perceptions around letting go of control, which is a big thing for a lot of advisors. And in step eight, we look at what you may want to look for in an investment partner. In step nine, we think about the stakeholder engagement and change management and making sure that we bring everybody along for the journey. There is so much to cover in these three topics. So sit back, relax, and think about what we're talking about in this episode. Simone, thanks for joining us again. We're at step seven where we're looking at the concept of uh, the perception of letting go of control as in letting go of control of the investment management. Now, for you, for you guys on your journey from our conversations prior, th- that was something that you did or you wanted to do a long time ago because you had very good reasons. Yes. Yeah, definitely. That was important to us from the outset that advisors focus on their strengths, which we believe is in uncovering client goals and putting in place the strategies to help them achieve those, that advisors focus on that and that we outsource the other parts of the advice process. And and that that goes for investment management to power planning to our basic administration is all outsourced, allowing advisors to focus on what they do best. Yep. Now, now with your journey coming out of, obviously, we sort of mentioned it earlier on, but it's a matter of the advisors were choosing the investments and that was something that was they were sort of told was something that was a big part of what they did but they didn't necessarily want to no no they didn't they didn't want to and they also didn't uh want to or they weren't supported in terms of them keeping up with that so it was very much a a setup um structure and then the ongoing advice piece was left sort of hanging so um in terms of the advisor built portfolios there's a lot of ongoing maintenance and paperwork and records of advice, et cetera, that go into that. And the advisors aren't necessarily skilled or have this, had the support to deliver on that for the client and then re- resulting in really inefficient outcomes for clients. Yep. So what does that do for the advisor's mindset then when they're allowed to then uh, let that go and then um, move into the world of, you know, communication and ongoing relationship? Yeah, it, it's, it's quite freeing. Uh, the advisor, our advisors feel that they have a deeper relationships with their clients now than ever before because in fact, they have more engagement points with the client. So this is also come to light during COVID in terms of the amount of online meetings that we have with clients. And we will definitely be taking that forward into the 
new normal, you know, when we all go back to the, to the normal world because it's enhancing the client relationship rather than detracting from it, which was our first, you know, a gut reaction is, oh, we can't, we can't do this because it's, it's going to be seen to be detracting. So it's certainly added to it. Yep. And to talk, so talk us through that. You mentioned the COVID time. Mm. Um, talk us through that moment uh, when we, when we sort of hit 2020 and, and markets dived and then jumped and went all over the show and nobody could work mm. out, uh, you know, exactly where it was going to be in any particular day. Um, talk us through that relationship that the, your advisors then had with their clients. Yeah. So that was, um, obviously everyone had, had, had challenges at that point and that was right at the same time where we were, um, obtaining our own AFSL. So it was certainly a lot going on. Um, but what we found then we had quarterly investment webinars with our clients and, and drum and capital, the portfolio managers sort of co-chaired those with the advice team. So we felt that that was very reassuring to clients as well as a lot of online meetings, a lot of phone contact, emails and communication. So, you know, it wasn't a, a panic situation. It was just obviously every, everyone was going through it. So it was just part of, um, you know, expectations. So it was a it was a challenging time, but I think it was made easier by the fact that we'd already had a managed account solution in place because what the advisors were communicating with clients at that time is the managed account solution is all about active investment management to take advantage of opportunities in the market. But for us and for our clients, just as importantly, it's about capital preservation. So at that point in COVID, when the market, you know, fell off a cliff in March 2020, it was all about that capital preservation discussion and how we were looking to do that compared to what was happening in, in, in the, in the share, in the market, if we were passively invested, what our outcomes would have been. So I think clients felt protected through that time, but it was necessary to ramp up the communication. And we did that through the webinars and the online meetings. Welcome back, Dave. Thank you. Uh, now, we are talking about the perception of letting go. Now, I mentioned the word perception there because because often people believe that uh, this is a thing where you're, you might have spoken to your clients previously about, you know, the, the, your ability to find a, a good investment um, and then all of a sudden you're talking about outsourcing that or using somebody else that might be, you know, better than you at doing it. Um, do you, is, there is a bit, a bit of a perception that you're losing control in this situation. You're losing control of the investments. What are your thoughts? Yeah, look, it's a good one. Uh, look, to be clear, we, we never sort of positioned ourselves too much in that space, but I can understand where people uh, would come from, uh, especially if they've built their practice over many decades and that's always been their value proposition. One thing I would say, I would arguably say you've got more control, right? And you've got better control over um, your client's outcomes over a wide range of clients, right? So if you wanted to implement your best ideas, you can do that extremely quickly, right? Without the need to um, call up the client, update their data, get an ROA and make that change or an SOA uh, in some instances. So I would say you are got more control um, in a lot of instances. Uh, it's all about how you articulate your role in that uh, investment process. But to be clear, it's your investment process. Um, you uh, do call the shots. You're just bringing in the best people possible to implement um, your process. Yeah. So the control in the decision making process is is one thing, but I guess control in the uh, the the process of how much you can charge and and how much profit and what efficiency you add to your business is also something that comes in to a bit more of a control. Exactly. So um, on the fee point, I know we kind of touched on it before. Um, obviously, your portfolios can be as high or as low as you wish. So you've got that, that tailoring there. Um, but in terms of the advice fees um, that we would charge, the efficiencies that obviously uh, it creates, our pricing methodology can be more around what we actually deliver uh, to the client from an advice perspective. Obviously, there, there could be a component um, regarding investments, but you start to have more conversations around the strategic piece and, and where we can really add value there. Melanie, welcome back to this uh, step in the process of change management process that we're talking about when people put managed accounts into their business. Uh, you've probably seen this a lot and had a lot of conversations with people around the concept of, um, you know, possibly losing control or the feeling of control. Who's in control now? Do, am I losing control? Talk to me about what uh, conversations you've had around this topic. Absolutely. I mean, and 
if you're looking at control, because I pick and control all the portfolios, introducing professional management or a managed account, yes, you are going to be losing that control. Um, I think the question then is, is that control you want to have? I mean, I think that's probably the more relevant question. If that is control that you want to have and you're really comfortable with that and you believe that and, you know, you've got your why for that, then that is a belief that you've got to work into the portfolios. Yeah, as you say that, I'm thinking of the words, you know, you always try and control what you can control and, and then realize what you can't control. And maybe that's a, there is a certain thing in there around, you know, you can't control how markets behave. Uh, and, and to be fair, doing, doing justice when your everyday job is looking and, and speaking and, and spending your time with your clients um, and controlling all the things around the client behaviors and, and controlling that relationship, maybe that uh, maybe it's not yeah. something you do want to control. Yeah. I mean, it's incredibly complex. The client's affairs are incredibly complex. And do you want to be an investment specialist or do you want to be an advisor? I'd, I'd challenge that you don't, can't be both. Yep. Yep. And one of the things I guess that you it is within your control or should be is the efficiency and, you know, the efficiency of the business, you know, the profitability of the business, all these sorts of things. Yeah. And the, and your governance over who you're bringing in to help manage the clients. You know, you, you have to do a whole bunch of work and continued work when you adopt a managed account to make sure you're comfortable and happy with the performance of these portfolios and the management of them. So it's not that you outsource it and, you know, kind of wipe your hands here. You have the governance role of all this. Yeah. And when you say governance, you're talking about, you know, obviously if, if somebody's not performing, then yep. you have the control to say, okay, uh, we need to try somebody else. Yeah. You've got the oversight of picking the managers and the consistent and ongoing performance management of these. And then, you know, you might get to a point where you want to change managers as well. Now, Tom, we are talking about letting go of control uh, and, you know, this is a big part. This is a big emotional and mindset piece of the, of the jigsaw puzzle. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience around um, advisors that have been through this process and, and the concept of them having to give up control. It's really interesting. It's, uh, first and foremost, in, in the traditional structure where advisors are obviously giving advice to the client and the client is accepting that advice. I'd argue the advisor doesn't actually have control. The client has control. So first and foremost, what control exactly are you seeding in the managed account structure? Because really if your decision is around recommending a product or a service or a solution in the same way you're recommending an individual managed fund, you are now recommending an individual portfolio or a holistic portfolio, if that makes sense. So the control element is still ultimately really the same. The advisor is recommending a solution for a client and the client is accepting of that. It's just now within that structure, there is some more, there is more discretion than there was before. And But it's not it's not really dissimilar to a fund manager who selects stocks. You are choosing an Australian equity manager to go and pick you know, the best combination of, of Australian shares within the market. It's the same way as you're choosing an investment manager to pull together the best group of managed funds within a multi-asset portfolio. And so I, I really don't think it's that different. It's just a perception that one element which the advisor may have been involved with, i.e. fund selection, they're no longer um, explicitly involved with. Now, we sort of touched on this earlier around the communication of this to the client um, uh, and the the, the buy to to the advisor buying into the process and then being able to communicate that concept of control to the client. Uh, tell us about what how, how you would do that with a client if you were um, transitioning from, uh, let's say you, you had a process in place, the client bought into your previous uh, way you did things and now you're changing it. Yeah, we spend a lot of time with our clients working through their sort of um, client proposition, value proposition, and the way in which they present the service. We think that that's, you know, it's really important part of the journey to empower the advisors to have those conversations. Uh, and so first and foremost, we start on the basis of we're a white label manager and so we're happy to sit in the background. And I think really for our advisors, they're just adopting what we're doing as their own in some way, shape or form. So they're saying we know that the markets are complex. We understand the, the need to evolve our business model, provide you know more resources within our business and, um, and better outcomes and really focusing back uh, on total portfolios um, in terms of objectives uh, and asset allocation. And, and then really positioning that with the clients as the as the go forward proposition. So they don't, in a way, they don't have to cede control. They don't have to tell them that there's another fund manager involved. They don't have to 
you know, be as explicit as that. There's nuance in, you know, presenting a partnership solution to the client that, that really puts the advisor front and centre still of the conversation and that's really what, you know, what, what seems to be most important. So the advisor is essentially positioning it as they're adding another level of expertise in the process? That's right. I think post-COVID, it's, it, that conversation's become a lot easier. So you had the fastest bear market in history followed by the fastest bull market in history. And so I think most clients understand that, you know, investment markets, the, the world is becoming more complex and, and it's much harder really to deliver, you know, good risk-adjusted returns to manage the complexity uh, and so the need to bring in specialist resources to their business to help them with the investment process, um, you know, it should be expected. Uh, and that's really what the conversation's all about is they're going, we've gone from trying to do this ourselves to now having an extended investment team, um, you know, which in, in for our clients is, you know, the seven investment team within our business is now the seven person investment team within their business and really showing it as an extension of their existing resources, which is powerful um, for the client. So it sounds like, Tom, there's a lot of different, when it comes to control, there's a lot of different um, aspects to it. How, I guess if you were to sum up this section, how would you put it? Just that I think all of our clients through observation have started out wanting to retain control. Um, but back to some of our earlier points, it is liberating to let go of activities that you're not specialised in. Um, in a way, an investment committee is a halfway house between traditional advice model and a full discretion model because changes only end up being made when committees meet in the same way that changes are often only met when advisors meet their clients. Now, by letting go, um, the accountability performance for performance and indeed the service delivery uh, is laid with that investment partner. And, and our clients in the end say through deeper, you know, through the service and through you know, better reporting and insights that they're actually having deeper, richer conversations with their clients despite you know, l letting go of the ultimate decision. And so you encourage, you know, when you're seeking service providers to really understand, you know, the full service and reporting support that they can provide you because it's one of the, the big upsides from, from going down the managed account path. Thanks, Simone. We're in step eight at the moment where we're talking about uh, what do you want from an investment partner? Now, this is obviously from a business decision, from an advisor, you know, point of view, and also as an, as an RM, you know, you, there's also obviously lots of different hats that you wear. Mm -hmm. Um and yet, uh, and when it comes to choosing an investment partner, what uh, what are your thoughts? What what were your thoughts on, on your journey? Sure. So one of the important things was that there was no conflict. So, you know, we felt it was important to find a partner who didn't have any particular vested interest in underlying investments. That was a, a number one priority for us. And from there, it was about the alignment of philosophy. So do they believe in strategic asset allocation as being the most important factor of, of delivering client returns? Um, and from there, how do they execute on the tactical asset allocation underneath that? So have they got the right resources? Have they got a team around them that can deliver on that? Um, how do they go about executing it? And, and do we have confidence, confidence in that? So we looked at a number of partners, you know, and, and ended up, um, landing on Drummond Capital, so so there was a, all of those. They were the main criteria that we looked at to start with. Yeah, and uh, so t tell us, talk us through that process. You, know, so you mentioned a lot of partners. Um, what did you do then? Do you practically went and interviewed them, or you? How did you? How did you do the do the research? I guess. Yes, well, a lot of it was online because it was during COVID. So most of it was online. In fact, we only met them face to face, um, you know, a year after we'd actually um, gone ahead with the, the whole project. So that was interesting. But similar to the client experience, it allowed us to have more communication with them than probably uh, in a face to face world. So, you know, we, we submitted our requirements and then they came back to us with a list of, list of answers and a list of reasons why there were synergies. And then it was from there, it was a process of, you know, the four of us really sitting around and, and, um, thrashing out how, what we wanted and what they were able to deliver, whether that matched or not, uh, whether we were sort of meeting each other where we both were, so, um, and, and how we needed to see that relationship unfold. So, yeah, it was it was quite a process. It probably took us about six months to to work through. Yep. And and how many different um, businesses did you did you interview or partners did you interview? There were four in total, but we we started with you know a list of six to eight, and we we relied on our uh, personal networks as well in terms of what other advice businesses were doing, who was doing it well, um, you know, finding out that sort of on the ground information, and then shortlisting it through that process. 
We had support as well from platforms. So most of our uh, managed accounts are on BT Panorama and we did have support from our business development manager um, at BT to help us um, through that, that, that due diligence process. Dave, welcome back. We are at step eight of the change management process. And this one is really just understanding um, what, what are some of the non-negotiables? What are some of the decisions um, around what you want when you come to choosing a, a partner? Um, talk us through your process and what for you was a non-negotiable. For us, a non-negotiable was they needed to um, understand us and, and be aligned uh, to us. We, we touched on it earlier, but it's, it was that accountability. We wanted to feel that our investment team um, was accountable to us and, and were capable of actually delivering um, for our clients. So, uh, you know, someone where they might have been larger uh, um, probably wasn't quite suited to us um, because there was uh, that sense that, you know, there was a new analyst, a, a new portfolio manager, a new person coming in and out all the time. Um, we wanted uh, to partner with someone that was really aligned um, to our business. Yep. That was sort of a, a non-negotiable for us. And we just felt the integration into our business uh, and making it part of our investment process all the more easier. Yeah. What, what was there anything that you wanted to avoid or, or, or stay away from or didn't want in the, in the process? Yeah, we, we didn't want to just replicate something that everyone else had. Uh, and that was kind of um, keeping in mind we wanted to create an edge for our business. Um, so we did want something that was tailored to our clients and our demographic and someone that could actually roll that out. Um, so we didn't want something that was just off the shelf. Otherwise, you may as well just engage in that product directly. Um, so that was a key thing for us. Yeah. Was there was there anything with um, regard to, um, you know, communications or running seminars or webinars or, you know, like having a having a, um, a partnership where you're actually communicating to the client, the end client? Spot on. So uh, a key requirement for us was to create key bits of collateral um, that we can roll out to our client base that it came from us. I think most would do that these days. Um, uh, at the time, there probably wasn't a lot, but I think a lot of consultants these days are quite good with the level of collateral that they're providing. But at the time, for us, that was a really important thing um, because we weren't providing too much of it, N nothing that was that meaningful uh, at the time. So that our business has completely changed um, in that regard. Yeah. Now, um, I just wanted to ask you from your client's point of view, when it comes to say your branding, what, what do they see? Do they see your brand or do they, is, is this kind of like you're using an outsource partner to create advice for you or are you using this outsource partners to create a community, you know, a, a line to your client? Yeah. So we, we get our partner to um, tailor the, the content for us, um, which is uh, with our company logo on it. But we do make it clear it is in partnership with our consultants, but it does come from our business. So, got all the appropriate disclaimers and uh, communication in there around that. Um, but we felt it was important that it was coming from our business to our clients. And when you and when you went through that process of interviewing and you know choosing who you're going to end up with, t t take us through that process. Was there a lot of backwards and forth and and interviewing one off against another, or was it sort of a fairly quick process when you met the right one? It, it, it was, look, it, it did take time. I wish I kept a diary at the time <laughs> um, just to go through that process. However, when we did feel like we, we've landed on the right um, individuals, um, that was a relatively quick process. Still a lot of, you had to build everything, right? Um, so we built everything from sort of scratch at the time. So there was a lot of things that we had to um, create. A whole range of things kind of sold it for us, but um, they were extremely transparent. Like we went into their trading desk, looked at their software, look at what they were doing, and it just highlighted how much an individual advisor just simply can't do this. Um, the amount of money they spend on tech, um, getting the right data, getting the right inputs, meeting the right people, um, that just highlighted to us that was a full-time thing in itself. And they literally lifted the the bonnet on all of it and showed us exactly what they were doing. And that gave us great comfort. 
Mel, thanks so much for joining me again. We're at step eight in the change management process, and this is really around, you know, w- you know, looking for partners, understanding mm-hmm. um, alignment, trying to work out what you want and, and and what to start looking for. Now, it's obviously a difficult thing. People be, be, go through this all the time. You don't know what you don't know sometimes. Uh, agree. And it's really hard to define what you want for an investment partner if you have no idea. And I think this step does stop a lot of people as well. Um, I really encourage you to reach out and ask an investment partner, how do you service clients? What services do you offer? Um, but some of the key things as well, you know, in that they'll have to explain to you their investment philosophy, how they communicate with you, how the portfolios are run, how are fees charged? I mean, does the client pay for this? Are you going to be paying for this? Do they sit on their, your investment committee? How does it all work? So I think, I'd really encourage people to be brave enough to just ask partners what the kinds of services that they offer. Um, key areas are around investment philosophy, level of involvement, communications, fees. It's also, I think, important to look at and being transparent with your investment partners and in this process, what your portfolios currently look like now. Be clear about the different dynamics in your business as well um, and where you want them to kind of be because you might have big CGT positions that you need to consider in this. You know, you might have one of your partners in your firms who really wants to stay involved and continue to pick funds in this process and you might have an investment partner who, you know, as being paid for an investment partner won't want that kind of step with having to convince you to do so while they're trying to pick a portfolio. So they're some of the key questions that I think you can think about. Um, But if you don't remember that and you're not clear on all that, also just asking the investment partners that you're thinking about, what kind of services will they offer and how do they work? Yeah, it's it's kind of like um as you as you say that it's uh, I'm thinking of the concept that it's not it's you're not just picking a brand you're actually trying to work out it's a relationship right you're trying to work out how they're going to work with you and how you're going to work with them in in a productive way that's that's just that it's like how are we going to have this relationship together where we're both um you know know what each other's going to be doing and know what the, yeah. each other's values are and understanding and and that thing that you mentioned that knowing where your existing portfolios sit now is pretty important. And yeah, it's it's often the simple questions that are the most meaningful here. Don't overcook it. I mean, it's just who does what when? Who's communicating with who when? How how do you get paid? How does this all work? Yeah. Uh, and and I guess uh, a lot of partners also have been through this process that we've been through in the last few steps around um talking to clients and overcoming and and those sorts of things and I guess you'd, you you know, you you'd be asking them to help you with some of that yes. stuff. Yes, this is not all on you. I'd be my key, you know, my last role and the teams that sat in that, we were solely set up just to help firms through this process. You know, there's a, all of the providers and the stakeholders in this are very invested in helping you through it. So don't waste that resource. Reach out, make sure you're asking, get them to take you through the process. And another tip is it is important to have investment partners who can articulate their value proposition and can explain it all to you. So if you're sitting there a bit bamboozled with what's going on, that's probably a sign as well. And and would there be different investment partners for say different demographics of clients or different um, types of types of clients? Or I mean, it's very easy to to look at the practice and the investment partner, but you know, taking their clients into into consideration. Most investment partners, in my experience, can make nearly any style of portfolio. I mean, some might cut it right down for some small real retail very baby accumulator clients. Um, but usually an investment partner will be able to cater to the entire spectrum of your clients. Um, the number of portfolios that you'll end up making will depend on what your client base is. So being transparent with what your client base looks like, um, you know, I've got this many clients in this segment, you might not have a portfolio for every single one. And, you know, you might also have your ultra high net wealth so that you end up with a managed account just for the core and you end up managing, you know, a, a satellite, I guess, for lack of a better term, in, in some other investments. But 
traditionally the key things that you'll need to land on is the investment philosophy, you know, active, passive. Another key thing is how much involvement the investment partner will not let you have but be comfortable in that relationship with you being there because some will be really comfortable with quite a collaborative approach and they'll bring to you their best ideas and sit around and, you know, discuss and then if you can kind of take it or leave it where others, you know, that's not part of how they work and part of their philosophy. You know, if you're paying for their services and their advice, they don't want portfolios that have been skewed. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think um, uh, as 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 you say that, I'm thinking to myself, the advisor sitting in the middle of the sandwich, going, um, "I want to be, I want the investment um, team to make me look good, um, as well as them look good." Um, and so, and then, to, and, and but but definitely would be thinking about this from the client lens to say, "What's the client going to be thinking in this point? Um, how are they going to see me, and how are they going to see my relationship with the investment partner?" And on, on reflection, even just mentioning that point, the firms that I've had that wanted more investment control initially um, haven't ever ended up there. And they've, you know, I guess relinquished all said control or just let the managers do what the managers need to do. It's been probably part more of the change process and the fears around letting go that have they've wanted to keep that kind of little door open that they can make decisions. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? It's a, it's a process, a fair process. And all questions that an investment partner will be expecting, so ask them as well. Make sure you're being really transparent with them and asking them how they're making the decisions. How do you find out about it? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure they've had plenty of um, conversations in the past and, and people have come up with ideas and they'll be able to relate that conversation. Absolutely. Tom, thanks for joining us again. In this particular step, step eight, we're looking at, uh, well, we're chatting about the concept of what to look for or what do you want from an investment partner. Um, I guess this, this uh, you know, this, this depends on the person and, and what they're after, but tell us about what you're seeing with regards to what advisors are looking for. Thanks, Fraser. Look, there's lots of different choices out there. It seems every day there's a new asset consultant or investment manager that's coming into the space to provide solutions. Um, so it is really important to understand what you're looking for. And so first and foremost, you're looking for resources that you don't already have in your business. And so when you're looking at, you know, the consultants or the investment managers that are out there, I'd be asking the same question as you of yourself around your own business. Do you have the resources um, to provide all of the services and expertise that are required? And we see a lot of very small businesses in this space and and would question the ability for them to deliver consistent um, service and performance over time. And so um, I'll be first and foremost, like in any assessment of investment management business, it's all about the people. What what are their backgrounds? What specialist expertise are they bringing to the table? uh, And how does that help you solve the problem for your clients? Yeah, that was certainly going to be one one of my next questions around the concept of is this like an interview process? Are we are you, are people are advisors out doing the interview? You know, the whip around and, and finding out uh, who, who they're going to choose. I think so. I mean, most of the most of our clients have been through some sort of tender process, whether they've you know through referral, um, asking platforms, asking you know other clients they might have met at a seminar who they've worked with. I think absolutely, um, that's important. So you know, they should be assessing. The different businesses, the alignment of interest is really important. So we're owned and operated by the investment team uh, and we invest in the portfolios alongside our clients. I think you need to make a strong assessment of the people in the business and the alignment they have to your client's success. That's that's really, really important. Yeah, okay, that's really interesting. And the longevity, I guess that means uh, longevity in the business partner. Um, talk to us about um, fees and how, how much um, sort of costs and fees and pricing plays a, plays a part in this decision. Sure. Again, different business models, different fee structures across the market. Uh, there's a number of sort of traditional consulting-led um, arrangements where the advice practice um, will pay for the fee in delivering the service. And I think in a way that's putting um, the pressure on the advice business without creating the alignment with the, the investment consultant or, or, or partner because there's no there's no incentive for the consultant to help you know conversion and alignment and service it's it's all the risk being put back on the advice practice so i'd say you know creating a fee structure that is aligned to long term success so 
not having you know minimum upfront fees, but actually having fees which align to you know the growth in the business, the successful conversion of the business, and the ongoing delivery of that you know that service um, is is a much better fee structure. Uh, and secondly, you know the scale of the partner that you're choosing are they able to deliver you uh, lower cost than you'd otherwise be able to achieve on your own? I think is really important. Yeah, and I, I guess uh, the that probably the, the last area here when you're looking at a partner is to look at the to and fro communication, what's coming out, what uh, what you can rely on coming out on a regular basis. That's right. So you know what what resources are they providing to you? So if they are putting the responsibility of reporting and insights back into your business, what efficiency are you really gaining? I mean, that's a really important question. So assessing all of those service lines, the reporting, the communications looking at that and saying, is this an enhancement for me? Can I actually take this, adopt it as my own and deliver it to my clients and give them a better experience? They're really important considerations. Tom, thanks so much for being part of this chat. We look forward to talking to you in the next step. Simone, thanks for joining us again in this conversation. We are talking about stakeholder engagement and change management. Really, what we're looking at here is the whole business um, uh, coming along on a journey. Talk, tell us about um, how you bring your staff uh, along on the journey. Obviously, we're talking about a change management process right here. So I imagine there's be some sort of a uh, process that you have in your business. Definitely, yeah. We had a full um, project plan um, scripted from the very outset in terms of what we felt we needed to do and who we needed to bring in at certain points. Um, It was important that the advisors obviously understood the reason for the change and that they were on board, but just as importantly, internal um, administration team as well because ultimately at the end of it, they're the ones that are implementing a lot of the advice. And so we felt it was important to demonstrate to them why we're making this change rather than just land on them. Look, this is the new way of, of doing things. So yeah, there was a whole, there was a whole project there and uh, many, many people were involved in that. So from um, the advisors to the admin team to our outsourced para planning team. So we had to make sure that they understood the new investment service and and we made sure we tweaked our SOA templates to, to cater for that. Yep. So a fair bit of not just uh, coming on board, but it sounds like a fair bit of training as well. Definitely. Definitely lots of training. And we also did role plays, which oh, some of the advisors didn't overly enjoy because it took them back to some of their previous days. But but we felt it was important to, to have that role play environment because clients will ask questions and and we wanted to all be ready as much as we could to be able to explain to clients the reason for the change. It's a really funny concept that, isn't it? Because Mm. none of us love a role play. Everyone's like, oh, really? Come (laughs) on. Um, But I think uh, there is certainly – it's the vetting process. You know, we, we use the word mm. vetting a, a lot, I guess, and um, it's that process of, you know what, there is a safe space, go and fail fast and get all that out Definitely. of the way. And then, exactly. and, and also when you're, you know, with, you, with your peers and you, and you are doing that role play, they come up with some magic and you just go, mm. that was, wow, I'm, I'm going to use that. That was amazing. That's right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And tell us about uh, any referral partners or anything, you know, bringing them on board or when you make changes. Yeah, so we work with predominantly three accounting firms are our main um, source of referrals. And we felt, we, because we'd always used managed accounts since 2015, it was, I suppose, they were quite familiar and comfortable with the way that we deliver the investment advice to clients. But when we changed to be self-licensed as well, we were initially concerned about, about their reaction to that, but they were um, anything but but positive. They felt that that was the way the industry was moving anyway. So it was just about getting on the front foot and communicating the reasons for that change and helping them to see that behind that, behind it all, we had a very, you know, robust risk management framework in place. And I think that ultimately it gives them confidence to refer because I don't believe that any accountant wants an advisor building an investment portfolio based on their thoughts and and processes. They want they want their clients to be referred to someone who's actually using an investment partner who it is their their job, their full time job with a full team behind them to build to build that portfolio. Yeah, and I imagine that if you've already set up the the concept with your clients and your referral partners that you're there to to bring the best ideas and and, yes. and it really is a conversation with you're coming to them with a, with what you believe is the best idea of the time. Definitely. And interestingly, of the three accounting firms, two of those firms um, both um, 
owners of that business have moved to this solution. So, um, you know, it, it's important that they understand it themselves by, by going through going through the process. David, thanks for joining us again. We're in step nine of the change management process where we really start to examine some of the stakeholders and uh, the engagement of those stakeholders. Let's start with your staff inside your business. How did the, the staff go with the, the transition or the idea and how did you bring them on the journey? Yeah, so our journey, it's it's changed a lot over the last uh, five years because we went from um, having our completely own practice um, with one of my business partners to then integrating into a, a bigger business. And we weren't just integrating what uh, we had built. We're now rolling that out across um, other advisors. And it'll be the challenge, you know, and when we buy new practices, we'll have to do the same thing. But regarding our stuff, it did take a while for them to understand. Um, but once the penny dropped and it clicked, they now see the benefit of it. Um, and that's now well and truly entrenched into our business uh, across the staff. Um, that's not just advisors. That's also the support staff as well. So para planners, admin staff, client service officers, uh, they are... Um, fully aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it um, and the steps in that process. Our third parties in terms of our asset consultants and uh, MDA licensee, we're very good at helping them train um, and trying to allow them to understand um, why we're doing things. And, you know, sometimes another voice always helps. You know, I'm telling them that this is what the best direction for the business, but to hear others and other peers um, speak so highly about it really did help um, resonate with our clients or our staff, I should say. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously you sort of feel like, you know, getting the staff on board. Um, and, and as you mentioned earlier, you know, having something that you can clearly articulate and some collateral around that and be able to demonstrate why it's such an important thing um and your your staff are a pretty honest um point to start that conversation with right because if, if the staff don't get it then the clients aren't going to get it and the referral partners aren't going to get it exactly and that just highlighted to us we didn't have our we weren't articulating as well as we could be right so um that just drove us to really drill into those conversations and what else do we need to communicate or provide to get uh, people to understand what we're doing. Yep. And how have you gone with your referral partners? You're a multidisciplinary practice. So obviously there's your starts with your, with your business partners and the, and the other um, streams of, of business that operate. Um, but what about external to that as well with uh, having conversations with any other referrers? Yeah, I, I guess it's one of the things when you're a multidisciplinary practice it's hard to establish key referral partners uh, all the time. We obviously receive a lot of referrals. Our clients are our biggest advocates, right? Uh, I guess when you do provide a lot of service lines, I guess the concern with some practice would be is that we would then steal their client, in, I guess, in a sense, for lack of a better term. Um, that's obviously wouldn't uh, be the case, but um, I, I guess we are well known within our respective niches and our demographic and um, that's always generated the leads um, for our business. Yep. Yeah, so third parties probably isn't the, uh, a major issue with us um, from that perspective. Mel, thanks for joining me again. We are talking about step nine in the change management process. And this is the part where we start uh, to making sure that we're bringing everybody along on the journey, that we're not just uh, the lone wolf shouting from the rooftop uh, and at all the staff and also, you know, partners and referral partners and everybody in that all the stakeholders are involved. Yep. Tell us about you. Tell us about what you see in this space. I think that this can really make a change process and project work well if you really engage all your stakeholders. Um, and there's an incredible amount of information that the power planners hold, that the client support staff hold, um, just making decisions at a firm or director level that, yes, this is our strategy, we're going to go forward and conquer said managed accounts. It is as simple and as easy as having a few hours with the back ends back staff, the support staff, the power planners, you know, the people that are really familiar with all the processes and systems, bring them along on the journey, asking them how this would work, flushing out where they're going to have problems in this because there are going to be things that you're going to need to address in this process. You know, you're not going to adopt a managed account and have, it's not going to be complete smooth sailing the whole time. It's just not. But the way to minimize it is to bring forward any friction points and then you can start to mitigate it. 
So little things like you might have to include extra things in your SOA or you might have to change your implementation checklist. You might have to, you know, get something ready for X plan, recode something. They're really easy little things to miss because you've also got to focus on the big picture stuff. But that is the stuff that when you start hitting go, it's like roadblock after roadblock after roadblock for your support staff and your teams. And that can get very fatiguing. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, the whole project management pay- space and obviously some some uh, people don't like getting into the nitty-gritty of all those change, all that change stuff. But um, when a lot of people um, in inside of practice, if you're bringing everybody uh, on board and you're setting the expectations that there are going to be friction points and, and you know, tasking people to look out for them and, mm. and, and lean into them and bring them forward as soon as they see something, I guess, um, yeah, I think that's probably a, a decent way of doing it. I'd say make make yourself bring them forward. So as you're kind of going through this process, sit down and go, okay, what is that what's that SOA process going to look like? You know, and have have a champion from your power planning team, have a champion from your client service team there and actually kind of go through step by step, okay, I go into X plan and do X, Y, Z. I do this, I do that. How will that work? What in what text do I need? What everything do I need? It's sounds worse than it is it can be quite a quick process to go through but it will save a lot of angst yeah yeah as, as, you, as we talk about this I'm, I'm thinking of the concept that this is a team effort right a big, a big change like this in the practice is a, is a team effort and if anybody's trying to do it alone then they're going to end up with a whole lot of pushback yeah and if you've engaged like back when we were saying in, in episode one about you know, what do we want the business to look like going forward? And in the power planning team, you know, if they don't want to spend seven hours on an SOA or four hours every rebalance every quarter, okay, guys, this is how we're doing it. We're all bought into that. This is how we're going to achieve it. How do we make sure this is successful? Yep, fantastic. And then obviously, uh, you know, there's there's other stakeholders in and around businesses like um, referral partners and oh. um, other stakeholders. Tell us about that process because I'm thinking it's kind of like, well, you know, we, do, do we bring them on after we've implemented or is it they, they, do they need to be, yeah. Earlier the better. The earlier the better and just biggest tip in everything managed account is ask, ask, ask. Just ask all the questions you don't think are real questions. They're simple, they're basic, ask them. Reach out to all the stakeholders that you have, all your partners, all your your entire ecosystem. Ask the questions, right? Um Everybody is invested, all of the investment partners, the platforms, everybody is invested on making this as seamless as possible and they all have teams set up to do so. So reach out at step one, the earlier the better because the more that they understand your objectives and how your business works, the more they can take the grunt work for you. Tom, welcome back to step nine. We're talking about stakeholder engagement uh, and change management. Now, obviously, we're talking about the teams um, around advice practices. Um, Tell us how important it is to get your whole team on board and everybody involved. You are really changing an enormous part of the way that the advice business operates and it is important that all layers of the team are involved. Firstly, starting at the top, often there might be an advisor that sort of led the charge, if you will, in, in adopting a managed account service. And it's important before you actually embark on the rollout that all advisors within the business actually agree and adopt you know, the new philosophy and the way of doing things. Because if we come back to the objectives of wanting to change the way in which investments are delivered at a business level and, and ultimately achieve that of business efficiency, then it's important that all advisors actually agree uh, and are looking to adopt the the philosophy and the service going forward. So it starts from the top down. But then secondly, the the change management process, you know, there's there's definitely work involved. I mean, every client will need a statement of advice in order to to make the transition. And so, you know, making sure that there's adequate resources and understanding within, you know, the power planners and sometimes that's internal and sometimes it's external. And actually, sometimes a great way to do it is to, to bring in for a period of time a project team of external power planners potentially that can help facilitate the, the transition and do so without burdening the, the existing team and advice process. Um, you know, and finally, then all the different partners that come together. I mean, the stakeholder management extends beyond the business. Uh, managed accounts require a specialist platform operator, so making sure that the engagement and training on the platform side, there's resources there for, for that. Um, there's the responsible entity, there's the investment manager, 
Uh, and so putting all of the parties together and having them coordinate um, to achieve the goal and set that out over, you know, it could be a 12-month horizon uh, and having clear accountabilities along the way is really the, gives you the best chance of, of success. Yeah, now obviously within that, within this step itself, there, uh, there is a whole change management process. Um, mm. So this is not something that you would just say announce at a, at a meeting and, and everybody has to jump on board. This is obviously a, a process within the, itself, as you mentioned, in investment committees and uh, responsible managers, licensing, mm. all mm. the way through to, uh, you know, power planners um, and people in, inside the office understanding how the, the new way of doing things around here. What's the sort of time frame that sort, that sort of takes in a lot of practices? The lead time before an agreed to launch can be anywhere from sort of three months to 12 months. I mean, we've seen them really drag out. Uh, again, some businesses really uncertain about when to start or when to create the business disruption. If they're at the beginning of the journey, they're just setting up the business. Potentially, they're, you know, they might be acquiring a practice. There's lots of distractions along the way. Uh, and so we see the most successful outcomes when the advisors all collectively know from a business point of view, that it's something that's critical to them to do, and there is no right time, but the, but you must start. They all know that really they must start, and once you get to that point, once from the top down at an advice level, all advisors agree that it's the path forward. Then really, you know, you can start the the process, the project plan, if you will, the change management process. But until you've got collective buy-in, I think as a as an advisor. Um, you know, within and, and all the advisors within the business, it's hard to um, it's hard to start. Yeah. Now this is uh, we, you know we're sort of presenting this as a twelve step process as well, and I guess when we come to the stakeholder engagement, it's a it'd be a good idea to start take go back to the step one and and, and run everybody through this twelve step process. Most definitely, most definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah. What are we trying to achieve? What do our clients want? What sort of business do we want to own and operate? You know, what's the end game here? And if it all comes back to that, then it, unfortunately some of us who may just find they're very busy, but it, it's important that they step back and put their business owner hat on for a period of time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, I know you sort of just briefly touched on the concept, but um, but referral partners is obviously a big part of this as well and, and, and explaining to, you know, centers of influence and referral partners and other people in and around your business that promote your business uh, mm. of the new way of doing things. Yeah, it's been quite powerful, actually. I've been out to see a number of these centers of influence referral partners with our existing clients to take them through the changes that have been made. And, and it's actually been overwhelmingly positive. I think, you know, counting Brisbane, Practices, for example, that are strong, often strong referrers into financial advice businesses, they get efficiency, they get business advice, and they get you know business management, uh, and they also understand the complexity of you know managing investments and often looking towards when they're referring to advisors, they're not often referring to them for the investments per se, they're referring to them for superannuation or pension advice or insurance advice. So they understand that the advisor's role is is more holistic than that, and so when We've gone out and presented to them that, hey, we are here with specialist and enhanced investment resources. You know, it's actually been a really positive conversation and we've seen you know, actually a pickup in referrals as a result of that. Mm-hmm.